Though our story is one step closer to Aslan's country, we now approach the most treacherous part of the journey. Shore up your nerves and keep a watchful eye. That land below is the Grim Valley of Evil, a place the children in the Silver Chair find both frightening and enchanting. The Silver Chair. Aslan sends Eustace Scrub and Jill Pole into Narnia to find Prince Rillian. The children's adventure first takes them east, where they seek the help of the marsh wiggle, Puddleglum. The trio heads north through Ettinsmoor, past the land of the man-eating giants, and across the wild wastelands to Harfang. It is here they discover that Rillian has been charmed by the beautiful, yet evil, queen of the Underland, and is living under a spell deep down in the belly of the earth. Under the growing shadow of war, it was hard to stay focused my first term at Oxford. I did my best. I met a fellow Irishman named Paddy Moore, and we became fast friends. But before the year was out, we were sent off to France to fight in what can only be described as the unskilled butchery of the First World War. The First World War was an exceptional conflict. The men went to the battlefield and lived there. They lived in lice-ridden and, and flea-infested clothes. They lived in mud, which was a mixture of earth and blood, constantly under, under attack, under barrage. In the spring of 1918, Paddy was overrun by Germans and taken prisoner. He bravely overthrew his guards and returned to the front to fight again. Miles away, I fell on the battlefield, wounded in my hand, leg, and side. Certain this was to be my death. Jack didn't talk about the war simply because it was so horrific to him, he did not want to recall it to memory any more than he had to. During my recovery, I learned that Paddy, while being treated for a leg wound, had been shot through the head and killed instantaneously. He was 19 years old. He and Paddy had made a pact that should one of them fall in, in battle, the survivor would look after the dependents, the one who fell, and Jack accepted the responsibility for Mrs. Moore and her daughter for as long as necessary. He was the man who went to war with four very close friends and was the only one to come back alive. He was a man who had to go back to the mothers of those friends and uh, share with them the extraordinary pain of their loss and to be standing, breathing, enjoying the good things of life and feeling the madness of that. What call have I to dream of anything? I am a wolf. Back to the world again, and speech of fellow brutes that once were men. Our throats can bark for slaughter, cannot sing. Jack's experience, I think, when he came out of the First World War was there was such horror all around him that he could not imagine a good God that would allow that to happen. Upon my return to Oxford, I adopted what I called my intellectual new look. I would concern myself with nothing but scientific, rational thought. No more self-pity, no more pessimism, and no more delusions of another world. This world is all there is. Complaining about it or wishing it were not so, can only lead to despair or madness. There is an arrogance that takes over people who have considerable intelligence. The arrogance is if I cannot explain it, if I cannot prove it, it cannot exist. And that was what happened to Jack. The years following the war were lean. In addition to my studies, I had the added responsibility of caring for Mrs. Moore and her daughter. Nonetheless, I buried myself in my books and completed three first-class honor degrees in the next four years. Here we are at the Bodleian Library in the centre of Oxford. Uh, it goes back to uh, early 17th century. Lewis was an extremely avid reader, and one of the letters that he wrote home to his father, Albert, he comments that uh, if only it had upholstered chairs and he could smoke in there, it would be one of the greatest places on earth. Contrary to what some may think, the First World War was not the greatest evil I ever encountered. Men in the trenches know that war is cruel and irrational, the most deadly evil is that evil which sells itself as something good. Wars are started by quiet men in white collars, who sincerely believe in the goodness of what they are doing. 
For Lewis, evil is the perversion of good. Evil is taking something that is a good thing, and evil just takes that and twists it. In Narnia, evil is not its own entity. So you can't say that here's this race and they are evil, or here is this uh, one group and they're always doing evil things. One of the great secrets of mankind is that when, when the chips are really down, when things are really tough, we're all the same. And Jack learned that in the trenches of the First World War. We're all brought into the world with the potential to be either valiant and extraordinary or horrendously cruel and corrupt. There's a balance in us and we must seek constantly not to go off balance, to stay over in the light and not shift over into the dark. In Narnia, sorcery and bloodshed are not the worst kinds of evil. The greatest evil in Narnia comes wrapped in a package of either pleasure or good sense. Most of the time when we think about evil, we think about gross physical enemies that are going to devour us in some way. But for Lewis, it's never the, the scratching out with the claws. It is more of a psychological or a spiritual kind of evil. So you have the queen here trying to convince the children that the sun doesn't exist, trying to talk the kids out of their faith, out of what they believe. And for Lewis, that's far more insidious, far more evil. What is this sun that you all speak of? Can you tell me what it's like? You see that lamp? The last thing with which we call the sun is like the lamp, only far greater and brighter. You see, when you try to think out clearly what the sun must be, you cannot tell me. You can only tell me it is like the lamp. The lamp is the real thing. The sun is but a tale, a children's story. Yes, I see now. It must be so. Since we will all face cruel enemies, let us at least learn to have heroic courage, even when we do not feel courageous. Puddle Glum, the Marsh Wiggle, turns out to be a hero, even though he's quite possibly the least courageous person in all of Narnia. Puddle Glum is modeled on C.S. Lewis's own gardener, Fred Paxford, who always took the glummest position on utterly everything. This is Paxford, and Paxford was a man who is outwardly exceedingly pessimistic but inwardly very optimistic. Paxford was the model for, I think, the most interesting character in the whole of the Narnian stories, and one that Lewis said was his favorite character, too. The natural response to great evil is fear, and Puddleglum is afraid, but and he has the courage to do what's necessary in the moment, and that's because of his, his trust in Aslan. One word, ma'am. Suppose this black pit of a kingdom of yours is the only world. Well, it strikes me as a pretty poor one. That's why I'm going to stand by the play world. I'm going to live like a Narnia, even if there isn't any Narnia. For Lewis here, the queen is trying to say, this is it. There's nothing else to believe in. And through Puddleglum, Lewis is calling his readers out of that mere materialism and to see that there is something else to long for.